Okay, good morning, everybody. We will call the Goodyear County Health and Human Services Board to order. We have a uh, quite an agenda today, and uh, before we get started on anything, Ms. Arneson, you just want to kind of take us through our, our uh, eventful day? Absolutely. Um, just to review quickly when it comes to the schedule that we'll be having, um, today's event is called here in beautiful Cannon Falls, Goodyear County, uh, Pitch the Commissioner. And uh, we'll start with our Health and Human Services Board meeting here at 1030. And uh, we'll officially introduce the Health Commissioner and also we'll turn it over to him when it comes to a, a brief Health and Human Services Board presentation. Uh, there will, um, afterwards, the Commissioner will leave with uh, some staff from Cannon Falls and community members from Cannon Falls and from Goodyear County and our staff. And uh, uh, he will actually walk part of the Cannon um, uh, Valley Trail to the park that we'll be having lunch at, to Lower Hannah Park. And lunch will be served at 11.30 for those that are RSVP'd. Anybody is welcome to attend. Um, about 12.50, the Health Commissioner then will do a community presentation at the park. And the presentation is called, What Does Minnesota Need to Be Healthy? And it will be also uh, at the park. And then at 1 o'clock, the fun and games will start. We'll have an opportunity to pitch the Commissioner and talk to him about the health of our community, talk about challenges, opportunities we have here locally <coughs> in Goodhue County and in state, and uh, uh, we'll also play some horseshoes. So uh, we're hoping to uh, bring some wins today for Goodhue County and Cannon Falls and beat the commissioner, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and hopefully that will be a lot of fun. And we're very excited and honored to, uh, uh, to have the uh, commissioner here uh, with us. Would you, uh, uh, I think at this point, if we can... Uh, we can move forward with agenda, and then I'll officially introduce the commissioner when it's uh, uh, time on agenda. Excellent. Okay. So we'll get to our business meeting. Uh, we'll begin with review and approve the July 2nd, 2012 annual board meeting minutes. Move for approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Review and approve the September 18th, 2012 board meeting agenda. So moved. Second. Discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Review and approve the following items on the consent agenda. We have two items. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Special guest and presentation, Minnesota Department of Health Commissioner Ed Ellinger. Great. Commissioner, we are very honored and excited to host uh, Dr. Ed Ellinger, the health commissioner here in beautiful Goodhue County and in Cannon Falls, and officially like to give some background for folks around here when it comes to um, where uh, Mr. Ellinger brings his experience in uh, education. Governor Mark Dayton appointed uh, Dr. Ellinger to serve as a Minnesota Commissioner of Health in January 2011. He's responsible for directing the work of Minnesota Depar Department of Health, which includes protecting and maintaining and improving the health of all Minnesotans. Some of his professional background includes Director of and Chief Health Officer for Baton Health Services at the University of Minnesota, Professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. He also served as the Director of Personal Health Services for the Minneapolis Health Department. His educational background includes MD from University of Wisconsin and Masters in Public Health from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We're very excited to have him here and we also want to thank uh, the Commissioner and your staff and also our local NDH staff including uh, Mary Orban, our nurse consultant, and City of Cannon Falls and everybody who has helped us to bring this together and we're looking forward to having a fun day with you. Welcome. Good. Thank you, Nancy. Good morning, everyone, and, and thanks, morning. thanks for the invitation to come down here, and thanks for having such a beautiful day. Uh, you know, I, I'm having these pitch the commissioner things uh, throughout the state, so I get a chance to talk with people at the, the local level, and also gives me a chance to wear some knickers that I usually can't do to work. You know, I figure I gotta <laughs> gotta spice up this little uh, tour to, to make it interesting. If people remember more; they, they'll remember maybe my knickers more than my, my horseshoe pitching. And, <laughs> and Nancy said that you know somebody was going to beat the commissioner. It's not hard to do. I'm not a very good good horseshoe pitcher, but it is fun. Minnesota has the largest number of horseshoe pitchers in the country. 
country on a per capita basis, and we've had many of the national and international champions come from, from Minnesota. And so I thought it would be a good thing to do a little bit of physical activity while we talk about public health. Uh, and I know there's always this uh, kind of uh, tradition of talking, doing business out on the golf course, but that takes a lot of time and it costs a lot of money. And, and uh, so let's find something a little cheaper and a little easier and a little bit quicker you can do in, in pitching horseshoes. And then you can put a couple of stakes in almost anywhere and, and pitch horseshoes and have some good conversation and anybody can do it. And I'm, but I'm really, you know, having a little bit of fun with this, but it's also serious because I as one of the you know, topic of what I'm going to be talking about is what can we do to become the healthiest state in the nation. And uh, we're going in the wrong direction in the state in a variety of, of ways that our, our ranking is going down and we're uh, having some problems that are emerging because we're not investing in prevention. And as a state health commissioner, my job is really not to run the medical care system or the, the Medicaid program. It's really to do whatever we can to improve the health of the state of Minnesota. And public health is a responsibility of all of us from the federal level through the state level, but particularly down at the local level. And that's where the, really the action really occurs. And that's why it's been so good to start going around the state to see what's going on at the local level and also commend folks for what's going on at the local level. What you've done with a little bit of ship dollars and the first uh, iteration of SHIP has been really quite remarkable and, and you know, really is sort of a stimulus for a whole lot of other things. Uh, same thing I'm seeing throughout the, uh, throughout the country or throughout this, the state as I go from county to county. But I'm also, it's, it gets a chance to come and, and thank you for the work that you're doing on this Health and Human Services Board. I've, I've been really pleased with what I'm seeing. Uh, local county uh, board members, uh, their passion, their commitment, their understanding of public health issues, and the, the health and human services boards that I'm seeing throughout the people are really committed to doing a good job. And I particularly like coming back down here because when I first came to Minnesota in 1980, I worked for the city of Minneapolis and had a relationship with Goodhue County because you had a dental health program, which was a model in the country. And I remember working with Elaine Timmerns uh, back in those times. And we really, we had something called Program of Projects. Minneapolis had a project, St. Paul had a project, uh, Duluth had a project, Goodhue County. And we collaborated to actually go against the state health department to make sure that those dollars continued to come to Goodhue and St. Paul and Minneapolis. And now I'm on the other side of the table, but remembering that, that it was a good partnership of the locals and eventually in partnership with the state that really continued on some really major uh, public health activities that continue to the present. I'm not sure what's going on with the dental program down here, but uh, my, my guess it's probably morphed into something else or, or gone away, but at the time was really a, a, a tremendous public health initiative. Uh, so I'm here to you know do a couple of things. One, talk a little bit about what I'm seeing is needed, but also learn from the people in the community. I want this to be a pitch to me. What do we, what is do you as a state health commissioner and what does the Dayton administration want to do? We're in the process of putting together our first real budget at the state level. You know, when Governor Dayton came in in the election in 2010, the budget process had already been uh, aligned for submission January of 2011. So, I mean, did some tweaking and certainly put his, his stamp on it, but now we're starting to build a budget and a policy agenda from scratch. Uh, and we're going to be putting that forward in the next several months. So it's important for me to hear what you're thinking, what suggestions you would have for us in our budget preparation, what concerns that you really want us to highlight so that it gets included in the process of trying to come up with a, a budget and some policy recommendations on how to move forward. Uh, and I'm certainly going to be arguing that we need to put a lot more into prevention. We need to do a lot more in integrating medicine and public health. Uh, that we are going to need a lot more community engagement. That's why I really like your involvement in county-based purchasing, which I think is just a really good model. I think that we would need to learn from that, the way you've integrated some of the health and human services things so you can look at social service, public health, and medical care in a more comprehensive way. Those are the kinds of approaches that I want to hear about and learn about so that we can build them into a, a system in the state that meets everybody's needs and saves money, but moves upstream and does prevention. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And if you have any pitches that you want to make right now, feel free to do so. Commissioner Allen. Yes, you know, when you go to build your budget. When you build your budget, don't build something and then it's not funded at the state level and then you move it down to the county level to pick up something that you have uh, built. So um, we've been getting a lot of that over the last uh, 
I don't know, 10 years, eight years, eight years that I've been a commissioner is that we get these mandates from the state. They come up with an idea, but they don't fund it. If, you, if you're going to do something, make sure you're funding it, not just moving a mandate down to us to do something. Yeah. It's not funded. Yeah. Because yeah. I'll vote no if we're not going to shift it to the tax, to the property tax owners. We have, we have to find things that are sustainable. That's one of the things, certainly in the prevention Affordable field. Too. Yeah. What, pardon? Affordable, too. Yeah, affordable and well, <laughs> sustainable. And it's a part of being sustainable is to be able to be affordable. And that's why we have to be really realistic of what we can do, what we can't do, and and where the resources need to come from. And I think it's a good point. We're, we need to make an investment, and, but it has to be something that we can actually do in our budget. Yeah. Oh. Commissioner? Yeah. Commissioner, in my private life, I deal with dentists. And as you know, their reimbursement rate for medical assistance is, is very, very low. So some of the MinCare tax, from my understanding, they have a surplus that are generated by dentists. If that can be reinvested back into the dental community for prevention for the uh, patients that are on MA, I deal with a lot of dentists. None of them will say no. I have not encountered one dentist that will say no to helping out a patient truly in need, but I have very, very few that are on MA because of all the different paperwork, all the different things that are involved. And the money they're putting back into the system with the MinCare tax, in my, from my understanding, has a surplus from the dental, and then it goes, you know, back to the, to the big pot per se. But if there's something you can do to look at that, that would be yeah. very nice. Well, it's, it's certainly, dental health is a huge issue in this state, and access to care, mm -hmm. and the affordability of care, and how that gets funded <laughs> is is something that we're looking at as we're looking at how we uh, how we reform our health care system. Dental care is certainly one of those, along the same thing along with mental health. I mean, those are the two issues that have been sort of set out to the side and, and put in their own separate silos. We're trying to integrate them back again to again to something that's affordable and something that's sustainable. So that is going to be part of the discussion of, of what we do. And certainly we're looking at the, the provider tax, uh, that uh, some issues that, you know, what, what we can do with that and what we can't it is certainly one of the, the levers that we have, at least for the short term. In our local United Way, we've looked into buying a van mm -hmm. for uh, dental health care. It's just, at the time, we don't think it's sustainable to be able to do that. Right. So, because there's a lot of need um, for the folks who don't have coverage. Right. Right. And as, as Commissioner Allen said, you know, you have to do it. It's sustainable. It, we, it is not good to put something in place and then have it go away after a while. It just That up and down thing is probably worse than, you know, starting at a smaller level and slowly building, but it's something that's sustainable. So thank you for bringing that up. Commissioner Bryant. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, Commissioner. And uh, just it's more, not really much of a pitch, but more of a, well, maybe it's a pitch, but a, keep, on, keep in mind as you're building your budget and doing the public health, the elderly and... Uh, their health needs as they go forward. You know, many of them were an aging population. Assisted living seems to be the <coughs> avenue where some of them are going. So um, keep that in mind, please. And the other thing, I applaud uh, the state um, for the, uh, the back when they did the tobacco, um, banning smoking in public places. And uh, I recall the conversation we heard from a majority of people that smoked, don't take our right away, but it was really the silent majority that really prevailed in that, and uh, I applaud the state for uh, taking the lead to make it statewide instead of going just county by county, by city by city. So, more of a comment, more than a pitch. But yeah, well, certainly the the uh, services, the elderly, they call it the silver tsunami. Although some of us think it would be the balding tsunami. Uh, you know, the the number of people you know, in our country turning 65 every single day. I mean, it is an incredible number, and so that we have to pay attention to that. Uh, and, a, and a workforce that is getting smaller and smaller relative to the elderly, uh, and the, all of the issues. And that's why, from my standpoint, one of the most important things that we can do is think about prevention. Because if you're if you turn 65 and are healthy, uh, you have a be better chance to, to live to be 85 and healthy than you know than not. And it saves dollars, has improves the quality of life. And over that period, living longer does not necessarily mean increasing costs. If you're healthy, the longer you live, actually the the overall costs go down. And so we need to do prevention. So we need to start thinking about the elderly in terms of alcohol use among the elderly. It's a huge problem and causes lots of problems. Tobacco use among the elderly, mental health issues among the elderly, that some of those are preventable. Obesity, diabetes, all of those things can be addressed 
from prevention and it's going to keep us from having people end up in, in assisted living, in nursing homes, uh, and with chronic diseases that are going to be really expensive and really hard to take care of. So that's one of those things that I think we, is on our agenda of terms of how do we deal with that because it's a, a coming issue. And tobacco continues to be an issue. Smoking ban caused, you know, created some really good things throughout the state, but also then we've taken our eye off the ball and, and tobacco use rates are now start plateauing. They're not going down as rapidly as they can. So we need to think of some new strategies to bring it down because that still is one is the leading cause of preventable death, the leading cause of death in this state um, that, that we have to be concerned about. Yeah, it, you mentioned uh, nursing homes and I think the I think they'll get you there the quickest when you, if you can't get out of a chair. So if you eat properly and exercise and get out of a chair, you're probably not going to end up there unless you have other problems. But what I see in a nursing home is uh, people, I think they're, <coughs> they are there probably a couple of years, generally, two and a half. What I think in the last years of their life, they, they should at least have one patient to a room, not try to put two patients in a really a crowded space. I don't know if the state has anything to do with that or not, but that's what I see. The biggest problem with the nursing homes presently. Yeah. Otherwise, when we have one in Canada here, they do an excellent job. They, uh, so I don't know if you can do anything about that or not. Yeah, and, and you know what? Uh, this smoking thing is just you know, I think uh, Goodyear County, we have uh, taken a lead on that, and and uh, we have a person that, uh, staff member that has really taken, done a lot of work in that. So you can give Goodyear County some credit for that freedom to breathe. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're looking for as many partners in tobacco control as we can because it's going to take, it's a collaborative effort. Um, the nursing home industry, I want to get back to your first comment. I, I don't know if I can change, you know, the 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 ratio of beds to room, but uh, but I, the nursing home is, ch is changing a lot. And most people end up are not in nursing homes for a very long time. It's actually post-acute care. You come out of a hospital or, you know, that, and you're in there for a short period of time. And so the business model of nursing homes is very difficult right now uh, to try to make it sustainable, fundable. And so we, we need to find the right balance of long-term care, assisted living, support services, uh, home-based care, all of which need to, it's a complex thing that we need to pay attention to. And so we do. We really want individuals to have the, the last years of their life, you know, be you know, living with dignity. And so whatever we can do to do that is part of our conversation and with no easy answers because it is a, a very complex and expensive uh, system right now. I understand that. Commissioner, uh, you, you know I work in the health industry, and, and what uh, we're seeing of late are uh, the insurance companies denying care, and uh, they'll they'll kind of almost go to the mat with you on on denying care, and uh, what that results in that uh, uh, somebody who can't who's not getting uh, care from their insurance company ultimately goes to medical assistance. So the insurance companies are essentially dumping on on the taxpayers by doing that. I know that's uh, to a little bit at uh, the Department of Commerce and some of your sister agencies that are involved in this, but that's what's happening out there in the medical uh, industry, in, in home care especially, because home care is one of the least expensive places to take care of somebody. It's the place they really want to be. They don't want to be in a nursing home. They don't want to be in the hospital, uh, but it's, it's difficult to get uh, insurance companies to, to live up to their contract and uh, fund uh, those uh, those cares that, that are so vitally needed. Yeah, well, one is certainly health reform. One of the, whether you like the Affordable Care Act or not, one of the things that it did was eliminate the pre-existing condition exclusion so that you could not deny <coughs> somebody because of a pre-existing condition. So it really shunt them to somebody, you know, they're expensive. And so that, that's been one of the benefits. Uh, of that that whole approach, so to needing really trying to get everybody to get coverage, get coverage that <coughs> no pre-existing condition and no lifetime exclusion in terms of the total dollar amounts. But the other thing that that you mentioned is that there's a whole range of services that are needed, and that's what I'm really interested in learning more about the county-based purchasing. 
where the community has some input and in where those dollars go. Because, you know, the United States spends, doesn't spend more dollars overall on health and human services than other countries. They spend a lot more on the medical care services than any other country. But in terms of health and human services dollars, which includes medical care, public health, and social service, we're sort of in the middle of the industrialized countries. <coughs> the problem is, is that we spend more of it on medical care than anybody else. So over half of the health and human service budget in the country is on the medical care piece. And what I'm interested in is in county-based purchasing is where you have some control over the medical piece, the Medicaid and, and the public health and social services, where best use those dollars? Can some of them go into home care rather than in clinic or hospital care? Can some of them go into some of the uh, home visiting as opposed to emergency room? Where you have, you can rebalance, you can readjust where those dollars go so that it is a continuum of care. And I think county-based purchasing offers some hope in doing that. So that's why I want to learn a little bit more about what you're doing with Sun Country and other county-based purchasing things throughout the, the state. Commissioner, uh, as for the commissioner in this board, I serve on the South Country Health Alliance as our rep. And uh, I can just say it's, it's I'm very pleased to hear your uh, positive comments towards county-based purchasing. We've, we've, uh, we've had our battles. Uh, uh, some of the big guys don't like us and uh, would rather, you know, not have us uh, compete. And, and one of the things I think that we can do with county-based purchasing and, and what we have done is we have taken uh, any resources that we've been able to save up at the end of the year and channel them back into the communities and be able to, to look at what can we do, do with these dollars that will positively affect the health and the well-being of our residents instead of just putting it off into some fund. And so we've been very proactive in being able to reach out uh, to all sorts of uh, vulnerable communities and, uh, and help those folks access better care and uh, access better preventative measures. And we appreciate the support from your department uh, as I've gone to the meetings over the last uh, year and a half um, I've heard uh, just very positive reports from our working relationship with the state, with, uh, with South Country and, and the state of Minnesota. So just pass that along, and, and uh, I do appreciate your interest in, in learning more about it and also uh, being an advocate for us for county-based purchasing. There's two, two, two priorities that I have. I mean, I have a lot of priority, but related to this is community engagement and community ownership of health. I think the, the decisions about what happens in a community, really the more local you can get them with, the more communities engaged in those decisions, the better. I think decisions are made in a better way, and that's why county-based purchasing is, is really intriguing to me. And the other is eliminating disparities. We have huge disparities in this, in this state, racial and ethnic disparities, but also geographic disparities. And I think unless we eliminate those disparities or reduce those disparities, racial, ethnic disparities, and geographic disparities, we'll never be a really as healthy a state as we can. And so again, that community engagement, dealing with what's going on in the community is one of the ways to reduce some of those disparities and also uh, bring everybody into sort of a, 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 a statewide improvement average that uh, will make us a better state. One of the areas that I'd like to have you look at is the use of helmets, especially with our motorcycle people. Um, and closed head injuries. I realize it would cut down on organ donation, but I think uh, we don't need them in that way. Uh, even kids on bicycles. I really would like to see more emphasis. You know, you see them going down the street, pell mell, and they don't have helmets on. They might have them on when they ride with their mother and dad on the trail, but they don't have them when they're out riding on the streets. So I would like to see that. It's just like infant seats, you know, and nobody would think of not putting their kids in an infant seat now. But we need to look at helmet use. And I know the motorcycle people are totally against this, but we're all paying for them, these people with these closed head injuries. Well, I'm a pediatrician, so I have worked in pediatric intensive care units and ERs and have seen kids come in with traumatic brain injuries and head injuries that could have been prevented from helmet use. And I, as you mentioned, it is a, you know, there are people who don't agree that, that we should mandate 
you know, use of helmets, and that has been discussed multiple times at the legislature, and, and the process has gotten to the point where you know, we're not not there to mandate it at that time. But it's, it's good to keep bringing up those issues because the data does show <coughs> that if you wear a helmet, you have less, you're less likely to get killed, less likely to have a, a brain injury that's going to cause a lot of problems. I think we just need to keep having that message out there, and, and eventually the, you know, the policymakers will decide where we should go with that. Commissioner, we appreciate you being at our meeting, and we're going to uh, let you get off the hot seat for a little bit as we continue on with our uh, business meeting, and then we can go uh, have some lunch and have some fun. So. Good. Well, thank you for the invitation, and thanks for having such a nice day for yep. me to be here. Yeah. It's always like this in Cannon Falls, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you much. Okay, we will move on to uh, action items, approving the new Integrated Health and Human Services mission statement. Mary. Hi, good morning. Um, you have before you our new mission statement, which is promote, strengthen, and protect the health of individuals, families, and communities. I did bring this to you sometime earlier this year. Um, we took our two old mission statements and combined them together, and we feel that this does show what we as an integrated health and human service organization would like to provide the citizens of Goodhue County. So we request that you approve it. The only thing I saw, and I don't know if it's a typo, but the one that was in our packet says promote, strengthen, and protect health of individuals, families, and communities. And I'm wondering if it should be promote, strengthen, and protect the health of individuals, families, and communities. We went around with the buzz. <laughs> so, sure. It just, it just, I don't know, it just read it, it, or it just read a little awkward to me without the the there, but. I don't know. And I think we initially had it though, and we took it out. Oh. So we can re-add it. I don't know whatever you want Gary. Mr. Chair, uh, I've gone through mission statements before. It's not pretty. <laughs> you know, there's a the. Where does the comma go? Where is it, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I agree with you, and I think maybe we should let staff, you know, do it. Because they're ugly trying to, you know, get ten people in a room and come up with something. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, does so someone want to? Uh, um, I'll make a motion that we adopt this with the uh, the in there. Okay. Well, Second. <laughs> Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, personnel committee request an update. Mike? Okay, we had uh, gone to the personnel committee on August 28th, and uh, what we wanted to do at that time, we had a, a senior office support specialist, senior that uh, resigned from the county. She had 22 years of experience, and uh, because of the increased complexity of the work, including the required <coughs> documentations, verifications, and timeline expectations for social services, what HNHS is proposing is to move our current social services front desk staff who is classified as a case aid off the front desk and have that position do case aid related duties for social services and replace the office support specialist senior position with an office support specialist position assigned to the social services front desk. This is a lower paying position than the other two and this reorganization would continue with our integration plans for the future. And uh, what it was was is currently the office support specialist senior that salaries and benefits, if you look on the screen up there, or if you have it in front of you, at 68469 And what we were proposing was to hire an office support specialist, and starting at step two, and somebody that had uh, um, family insurance, that would be $44,602. Currently, our front desk person is a case aid, and that range is $1,489 to $24.70. And the office support specialist, that range is $10.67 to 1895 so it was a lower paying position. So we went to the personnel committee and there, what happened there was the, the committee pro provided no recommendation and requested the HNS department come up with an alternative solution without an external hire. Uh, since the personnel committee meeting, the department has maintained <coughs> the course of passing on 
Most of the resigning employees work duties to other support staff and accounting staff. Currently, we are up to 14 staff that we are separating her duties out of, of doing. And we are working with our front desk staff and social services supervisor to come up with a solution that could maintain coverage for our social services front desk without jeopardizing the work quality and delivery of service. So the h and department provided its recommendation to the personnel committee. The personnel committee had no recommendation but a request to come up with an alternative solution without hiring a person. So I guess if you want to have any discussion, if you want to uphold the personnel committee's recommendation of not uh, having a recommendation at this time, but come back in three or six months, depending on how we work right now, we've got it split between 14 people, which isn't the most beneficial way because now we've got too many fingers doing too many things that, you know, we don't know how that's going to happen because, you know, it's 14 people doing what one person used to do and, and each one is, you know, doing cert certain parts of it. So we'll have to see how that goes. But right now that's what we had as our um, alternative plan was to split that up among 14 people. But... It is kind of difficult to do that, but just a question. Why don't you define uh, what does a support specialist senior do? An office support specialist senior is, is more or less of a, a lead office support specialist. They would do more things like, oh, like more higher tech office support duties, like, like Terry, she came to the board meeting. She was doing the minutes of the board meeting and preparing the uh, agendas for the board and doing all the, the, the board type of work, typing up all the board minutes and all that kind of stuff. And then they would do other higher level type of office support specialist duties. Are there alternatives other than replacing that that you've explored in the last three weeks since you've been before the personnel committee? Yeah, what we did was we, we took a lot of a lot of her duties that were the more high level and we split them up among 14 different people. And what the idea was is we wanted them to move Renee off of our front desk because she's actually classified as a case aide, which is a higher paying position than even the office support specialist senior position that we felt it would be more beneficial if we had her give more support to social services because of the more needs that are coming down now because of the the complexity of the um, the work that the social workers are doing, they need m more support to help them. So we were going to move Renee off the front desk and then replace her with a, a lower paying position at that front desk. Is there, I'm just asking here, is, has there been any dialogue with county administration to see if there's some, because we have two groups doing information providing to basically one board. No, there hadn't really been any discussion on, I mean, on that. This gets back to my original comments and, and the things that I dialogue before is, you know, we have this meeting, which is great, but is why, why aren't we looking at integrating this meeting into the county board meeting where you can meet twice a month instead of just once a month? I'm just bringing that conversation up again as we go forward. Ron. Uh, now, I thought I read something about you were trying to divide some of the front desk duties with the mental health a person at front, the front desk. Was that discussed? That, that was from the personnel committee. That's from the personnel committee. Uh, yeah, where we had discussed about uh, whether or not we we were just talking about the, the front desks in that building and um, whether or not we could eliminate a front desk and have people come through one door and then go off. To, so that, that's probably where. You, right, right, right. How, is that, how did that work out? Did you look at that? Well, Right now, the way the building is designed and stuff, it's not going to be beneficial to actually close one of your front desks now because we can't limit the access to people going to those front desks. We would have to add in some costs of, like if we eliminated the front desk on the first floor, we'd have to add some costs in of closing off the access for people not to be able to go walking around the building without, you know, having access to it. So we'd have to add some costs in of closing off entryways so people couldn't just come into the building and start walking around. Yeah, <clears throat> Mr. is right. We, we discussed that about closing off one of the desks, you know, but, you know, af after we had that meeting, uh, I, I did make an attempt to, and I did, visit 
uh, that building. And that building is, uh, is very busy. Uh, it's already confusing to our public, I think, unless you're used to how it works. I'm, I wasn't used to it, so I had to ask, you know, for help to get around in there. And uh, So <clears throat> I, I guess, uh, so I, I think we have to have all these, someone at all those deaths, whether so it's there four, five, four, yeah. That's probably very important. So, I mean, there's no because there are different floors, except for the f one. But anyway, so uh, what it really, what I really learned from visiting over there is that we need a building, a, a, a more modern building, and then, then we can do all these things like uh, the personnel committee <coughs> discussed. You know. We probably won't, certainly won't have. I don't think uh, four desks. So. But it, what we're doing right now is, uh, if you look at the math on this, we we could. They are suggesting hiring a person at a lower salary. That's the way it works out. So I think it's not going to be a financial burden on the county, or, but. Right now, we're we're taking we'll be taking if we are not already a higher paid person for the salary, and sitting at that desk where we could hire someone at a much lower salary. So I don't really see uh, looking ahead. I don't see that they're going to find anybody over there that that'll really fit in there. So I don't. You can wait if you want to, but I, I don't see why you would wait because the end result is it's going to have to be filled. So that's my uh, my thought. And say they're busy over there. You know, I, I commented after these, these people are just as busy as air traffic controllers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I have on it. But, okay, one, one other thing about Commissioner Bryan brings up an issue. You have this Board of Health here, and then you have the County Board. Well, does, uh, do they have to answer legally to both boards? Not legally, but do they answer to both boards? I, I don't see the reason that the Board of Health can't make a recommendation and then not have to go back to the board, county board. So does they, can anybody answer that question? I think that'd be a good topic to discuss with uh, county attorney's new <clears throat> Okay, so we won't go for any further with that. I guess, uh, you know, my, my thought when looking at this position is if we do move forward with a new building, <coughs> get by with front desks to me it would be it, for the person who were to get this job it would be worse to hire them w under the old building and then when we get to the new building lay them off because you know that position is is gone um, and so the thought in my opinion is if we can make it through until we move forward um, we don't have to worry about that and the other thing too would be if we could uh, also utilize um, people within the organization if you know we we do have quite a few front desk people um, in other parts outside of, of uh, social services um, you know just on the first floor I know we've got um, one front desk for extension and one front desk for land use and, and one front desk for veteran services if there's some way we can uh, you know restructure that and have one of those folks go over then we could take care of that if they went over for half a day spent half a day at, on the first floor and a half a day over there but um, you know this, it, this was uh, the area that really uh, the health and human services was the area not your fault at all but um, that had the biggest strain on budget for 2013 and so that's where my thought was we have to try and, and uh, <coughs> do some things here that help to reduce that impact 
How soon do you plan to move ahead with this building? Well, we got the RFP out today for buying the citizens building. So they're going to do some tours and they're going to get uh, RFPs back by November, November 20th, I think it was, the limit. So we should know from there at that point where we're going forward. I agree with Commissioner Retzigal. I mean, if, if the county board is thinking about building a new building, why would we make a decision to hire someone that might not fit in in the new building? We're not looking at a year or two or three down the road. You're looking at months. And I would recommend that, you know, we continue to uh, divide the duties. And I understand that it might not be as efficient because some of the folks that have extra duties are probably being paid more than this particular this particular person would. And so if there was no building issue in front of the board, I would say let's make a decision one way or another now. But I, I think, you know, holding off a couple more months uh, might be a best decision overall. You want me to just, the best way to handle this is to table it uh, to a future meeting date of four, three months? I think there's a recommendation, or not a recommendation, a comment in the narrative that, to uh, um, consider looking at exploring it for months down the road. I read that in one of them here. Um, that may be an option to bring a report back. Uh, uh, we are we will try for a few months. If it's not working, the department may, will be back to request the position again. So maybe a, give it some yeah. till start of 2013 to see how it's doing and then we'll have some further information based upon the dialogue earlier here okay. so do we need action on that or because I think uh, he's asking for a request to fill the position so I guess we do have to make a we have to act on that well, request why don't we just go by the personnel's recommendation <laughs> and then you can come back at a later date instead of tabling it because it why don't you I'll make a motion that we uh, um, instruct, uh, instruct staff to uh, keep working out ways to try to uh, figure out uh, another way than bring somebody on and bring back a report to us at the January meeting as to where we're at. A second. Discussion? I know it's not what everybody wants, but it's probably the best thing to do at this point based upon so many unknowns. Well, what you're saying is you go, go ahead with the personnel's recommendation. Personnel recommendation, I read, but it gave no recommendation. Well, so I will help we recommend not that. That's true. We did give a recommendation. The personnel committee had no recommendation but request to come up with an alternative plan without hiring a person. Well, that was the recommendation. Okay. But also before that, the idea was to try it for a few months. Yeah. Commissioner, I think your motion actually reflects the what, the, what we talked about at personnel. So okay. I, Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Approve accounts payable. Is there a motion to pay the bills? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Informational items, second quarter fiscal update. Mike. <clears throat> okay, this is for the second quarter 2012 fiscal reports. Uh, the Goodyear County Health and Human Services Department expended 50% of their budget. 50% of the way through the year. We've collected 46% of our anticipated revenues 50% of the way through the year. More specifically, salaries, benefits, and overhead, we expended 50% of our budget 50% of the way through the year. On our home placement budget, we expended 53.6% of our budget 50% of the way through the year. The other handouts that are below there is just showing the revenues and expenditure budget of uh, of uh, re revenues at 46% and expenditures at 50%. The next one shows our statement of revenues and expenditures for uh, salaries and, and benefits and overhead, showing that we're at 50% of the way, 50% of the way through the year. And the other handout is showing that our home placement not right now is um, at 53.6% or 3.6% over budget halfway through the year. One quick question. Mike, with the with the downturn in the economy, how are the collections, child support and things going? I think uh, I haven't seen it with child support recently, but I think the collections have been a little bit down compared to other years. But then we do get a lot of money coming in back from, from revenue recapture and now the 
the federal government or the state government is also filing on uh, tax offset program with the federal government for for um, child support payments. The counties can't go for that, but but the Ch state office of child support can go off the, the federal taxes also. Thanks. I see uh, from the budget you're looking at 2012, 2013. The budget that you predict or project will go up. $21,000 between the two budgets. You know, that, that really isn't the issue that's going to impact us, I think. Again, it's the continuation of the state to shortchange us in funding, and that will create possibly, a, you know, our shortfall. Is that what you see also? Yeah. For, well, for the 2013 budget, which we'll actually be getting in and looking at a... You can, I think you can go right into it, Mike. Okay. Any other questions about 2012? Okay, go ahead, Mike. Okay, for 2012 or 2013 Health and Human Service budget, this is just our a budget process that we started back in 2011 in December. Um, this was actually was uh, adopted 2012 budget and acknowledged the 2013 county preliminary budget because this was actually was a two-year budget cycle that we'd worked on, and those are the different dates that uh, we've worked on for our, our budgets worked heavily with the uh, county administration and the finance department on working on on budgets. For 2012, our uh, health and human services expenditures totals was $12,877,009. Tax dollars needed in 2012 was $4,458,089. For 2013, the, the preliminary expenditures are $12,898,913, or a tax levy of $5,103,705. The actual increase in the expenditures for Health and Human Services for 2013 is $21,904, which was a 0.0017% increase. The increase for the levy actually was 645616 And what that difference is made up of is um, the purchase of uh, services and client payments. We had a decrease of 20185 Overhead, <coughs> we had a decrease of 169396 Salaries and benefits increased 211045 Use of our fund balance decreased 60132 our state revenue, that decreased 154589 Federal revenue decreased 46411 Our charges and fees that we charge clients, that was a decrease of 75448 Why was that such a big drop? Um, we lowered our uh, fees that we collected for out-of-home placements because our expenditures have gone down. We don't have that many kids in out-of-home placement anymore. so. When we're not paying out that much money, we're not receiving that much money back from the parents because their kids are no longer in out-of-home placement. Sure. That was the, the biggest item. But there is a, um, a spreadsheet out there that we can, we can actually, I think was part of our, our um, downloads that we have, is you can actually look at each individual line item that comes up to the 645000 It's just a spreadsheet that's out there. If anybody does want that, we can forward that to you also. And then the big item was our transfers in, which was a decrease of 287132 And the difference there was the levy increase of 645616 And at the budget meeting, it sounded like a lot of our discussion was our, our levy increase went up 645000 But our overall budget actually went up 21904 So we're going to have a little discussion about the explanation of transfers in because um, if we get to this side slide here what it is is uh, <coughs> the transfers in these are dollars that are transferred from one county fund to another county fund H&S would pay for an items that normally the, the general fund was paying for for all county departments because H&HS can obtain some state and federal reimbursements on these items the total cost was going through the H&H books 
and the general fund would transfer the non-reimbursed costs back to the H&H's fund. One particular item that was the county was paying for was the county HSA contributions for each employee's health insurance. For all funds and departments, this expense was paid from Fund 1, Department 1, <coughs> general government, except for the expense for health and human service employees. That expense came from Fund 11, Health, health and Human Service Fund. What h &S did not receive back from state and federal funds, the difference was transferred into the h, h funds in a transfer in line item. This was the only salaries and benefit item that was not being kept track of in each individual department's budget. So now each department is responsible for having this part of their budget and levy request. This does not have an effect on the total county levy, just each individual department. H&HS will no longer have revenue coming in from object code 5947, which is the transfers in, and general government is, is an expenditure coming from object code 6997, the transfers out. So if you look at that example, the old way what it was is H&HS would have an expense of $10, H&HS would receive federal and state reimbursement of $4, the Goodyear County General Fund county levy, they would transfer $6 back to H&S, h, &S, h &S. so we took care of our $10 that we needed to fund for our HSA, HSA um, contributions for our employees. Now the new way the county is doing it is h &S still would have our $10 expenditures. We would receive our $4 back from state and federal reimbursements, and now h, &H &S must pay from their own h, &H budget county levy of six dollars so it's no longer coming from the general the general fund it's now being part of our budget versus the general county budget so i think everybody at the budget meeting was a little confused that oh health and human services their budget went up six hundred forty five thousand well that really wasn't the case our budget only went up twenty thousand and, and a big portion of it was this two hundred eighty seven thousand was from transfers in from the general fund back to our fund and now we have to account for those <clears throat> expenses within our our budget instead of the, the county's budget so i hope everybody has a little more better understanding on how our transfers in actually works well, sure, okay. will that happen again in 14 and 15 or is that just a one time that transfer in well that for the for the hsa well now everybody's going to account for them in their own budgets so now that 287,000 will be in the H and H budget instead of the general county budget. So it'll, it'll just be paid for in our budget now instead of the county administration's budget. Great. So we're just looking at the county shift, as they say. So there's another area of the budget then that is $600,000 looking $600,000 to the good, right? Uh, I mean, two hundred eighty-seven thousand. Two eighty-seven. That'd be the county. Yeah. Because the other portion, the other portion that made up our levy increase was our, was the, the the federal and state reimbursements that have gone down. But a big chunk of it was the two hundred eighty-seven thousand that was related to transferring from between the two funds. Uh, the next slide here is just our proposed H and H revenues. Uh, we receive 40% uh, of our revenues from county tax levy, 30% uh, from the federal government, 14% from the state, and 13% for services and charges. Uh, major, ex major expenditures that we have by categories is income maintenance department is 19%, child support 7%, social services 34%, mental health 20%, Long-term care and waivers, 7%, and public health, 13%. Um, these are some of the highlights of our major fund changes from uh, the federal and state revenues. The first one is our Vulnerable Children and Adults Grant. Um, you can see the history here of what our allocation, original allocation was back in 2011. It was started out at 676796 after they got done with the 2011 legislation they've they did a revised allocation so they cut our grant during the middle of the year of 2011 to 599 042 so in 2011 we had a reduction of 77,754 
2012, we had a reduction of $268, and now in 2013, we're having a reduction of 81668 For our MFIP uh, consolidated fund, um, there's a showing the original allocations are revised. So in 2013, um, our allocation is 308528 so we're having a reduction of 52758 which is the highest deduction over the last three years that the state has passed on to the counties for the MFIP consolidated funds. And a lot of the consolidated funds actually goes to our workforce development uh, um, agency that does our employment services. So we just uh, cut our employment services that we do now with the workforce center. So that's how we help cut some of that cuts down was we uh, reduced our um, allocation that we give to workforce development. Um, our adult mental health CSP program, uh, in 2013, we we're actually having a 0% a uh, re reduction, but you can see back in 2011, the original allocations, they've slowly c cut that back the last two years, 2013, they, they did not give us a cut. Our uh, DD, semi-independent living skills and the family services uh, support grant, uh, 2013, our SEALS grant is cut uh, our allocation is 41411 That's a decrease of 9956 But our allocation for our family support grant for 2013 uh, went up actually $39. Um, here's our uh, basic <coughs> sliding fee for child care. Actually, uh, we've had an increase of $22,959 because what's happening is the last few years, the state actually has a surplus for what all counties are spending for child care, so they reallocate that money out to the counties that are overspending their, their money on child support or um, child uh, care things. So all counties got an increase of uh, for 2013 because of the surplus that they've had the last two years in the child care fund. Our local public health grants, um, that just increased uh, like uh, $25 or so. And our TANF home visitation grant, that stayed the same at 47,462. Um, just some highlights for the state uh, child support incentives. Uh, the state funding for child support action related incentives and, and guidelines implementation with discontinued in 2011. Counties will continue to receive state incentives from the cost recovery fee revenue. And what that is, the, the state charges Everybody that's receiving uh, ch uh, child support money, they charge them a 2% of what they collect, and that's what they're paying back out now to the, to the counties as part of their incentive since they cut the other portion. They're paying it back now with the recovery fee that they're collecting. Um, for the federal child support incentives, the DHS estimates that the statewide federal incentives for federal fiscal year 2013 will be consistent with 2012 level of $12 million. Uh, for the Minnesota Sex Offender Program, um, that law changed back in 2011. Now that anybody's uh, committed after August 1st of 11, we actually will be paying $29,747.50 for each sex offender that happens to be, be committed. Uh, the cost before July 31st, 11, the county is actually paying 11899 So uh, that law is still going into effect. I know there's some uh, state court law out there now that I think the federal government is looking at, Minnesota looking at their MSOP program because they're looking at it that these people are going to be committed for life and they want to relook at that program. So there's some courts that are actually looking at the, the MSOP. Uh, the chemical dependency, uh, this year Goodyear County needs to revisit its CD fund policy that was adopted by the Goodyear County Welfare Board on August 23, 2002, and an amendment on March 21, 2006. This may have an impact on the county's bottom line. Um, federal and state reimbursements, additional modifications have been made to staff assignments in order to maximize social services time study funding. Uh, this includes transferring back some public health staff to meet the state compliance expectations and adding more support staff based on the changes of streamlined integrated health and human services duties. Uh, vaccinations, as of July 1st, 2012, MDH announced an eligibility change in which 
MFVFC could no longer be used to underinsured children in private clinics. Public health clinics could continue to vac vaccine underinsured children. And a new policy by CDC, Centers for Disease Control, takes effect October 1, 2012. The new CDC policy prohibits the use of federal 317 vaccine funding for individuals that CDC considers to be fully insured. The CDC defines fully insured as anyone with insurance that covers the cost of vaccine, even if the insurance includes a high deductible or a copay, or if a claim for the cost of the vaccine and its administration would be denied for payment by the insurance carrier because the plan's deductible has not been met. Um, here's just a list of some new laws and opportunities for health and human services that will be coming our way in the future. Um, we have a, right now we have 100 dedicated health and human service professionals. There's 80 full-time and 20 part-time. We have a higher demand and higher expectations and h &S integration, streamlining, and continued work for co-location. And we're currently doing some regional collaborations where we're doing Four Corners Partnership, the Beacon Project, Mental Health Consortium, CD Pilot, Healthier Communities, Advanced Practice Nurse, and Regional Contract Manager, and South Country Health Alliance. And we'll also be looking at some new regional collaborations within our region. And I guess that's about it. Hmm. All right, a lot of information helps to explain things very well. Thank you, Mike. Um, any announcements or comments? Not. I think we are uh, a little bit late for our next event, so we better get moving, I suppose. Is there Motion to adjourn. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. We stand adjourned. Yeah, that's fine.